This is Berlin seen from space. Here is London. And this is Rio de Janeiro from above. Do you notice something missing? Where is the agricultural land that feeds us? Modern cities have kept farmland out of our sight. We don't actually see where or how our food is produced. But because we're animals and because we need to eat, we're actually dependent on the natural world. The problem is that the way we produce food is depleting it. After World War II, with the growing population and the rise of a consumer society, yields needed to increase, so the agriculture sector underwent a so-called green revolution. That's when chemical fertilizers, pesticides, and fossil fuel-powered machines entered the agricultural sector, replacing manual labor and, indeed, increasing yields. This worked for a bit, until it didn't. On paper, agriculture might be thriving, but it's failing according to almost every other measure. Today, the entire food sector is responsible for about 30% of the world's man-made greenhouse gas emissions. The world produces 1.3 billion tons of food waste every year, while 1 in 10 people is undernourished. Agriculture today is slowly chipping away at the natural world. It's the sole driver of about two-thirds of the loss in forest cover every year to make space for cropland, pasture, and monocultures, mostly in the tropics. Right now, the way we eat is a significant driver of climate change. But it really doesn't have to be. So agriculture can really be part of the solution. It is now, at the moment, part of the problem. Maybe not the biggest, but it's a considerable part of the problem. There is a need for a big transition from destructive farming or industrial farming uh, or chemical farming that we're doing now at the moment. And we need that transition to regenerative farming, which is kind of working together with nature instead of against nature and building up stronger systems. That transition needs to happen very fast, but it's currently not really happening. At Ecosia, we believe agriculture is a forgotten solution to the climate crisis, which is why we launched the Ecosia Regenerative Agroforestry Fund for people who want to transition their farms to a regenerative model or launch a new project altogether. But if we want to change the way we do agriculture, we first need to start with a simple question of who controls farmland today. You've probably heard about regenerative farming before. If not from us, then from everyone, really. It's become somewhat of a buzzword. Simply put, regenerative agriculture refers to farming practices that aim to continually rebuild soil biodiversity, which among other benefits has the potential of drawing down most man-made carbon emissions. But let's stop right there. We will go into the more technical questions of regenerative agriculture in this series, like how it can be scaled. But in this episode, we first want to focus on a topic that is often overseen when we talk about uprooting our farming system. Land ownership. If we don't address that, the potential of regenerative agriculture will fall prey to the injustices of our current food system. Point blank, historically, the only way we've been able to grow our cities is by extracting what we needed from elsewhere, with little regard for people outside of them or for nature. As the urban architect and author Carolyn Steele explains, this extractivist mindset started with the Romans, when they first ventured on what she calls a militarized shopping spree by importing food through wars on other nations, which European colonialists later learned from. Food sovereignty, food justice, that is inextricably linked to race, unfortunately. And because of the way that our food system was built, stolen land from indigenous peoples, stolen labor, from enslaved Africans, um, that just was woven into the fabric of the food system here in the United States and in many other places. Fast forward to industrialization. With the arrival of trains and then supermarkets, urban spaces became even more firmly separated from the natural world. Urbanites no longer had to give much thought to where their food came from, who grew it, or what ecosystems supported it. To this day, our agricultural system is dominated by that same logic, an extractive model that not only exploits the soil, but relies on cheap or unpaid labor established to supply affluent urban spaces with an overabundance of food, most of which we end up throwing out. Wenn man dann versucht auch die Leute wieder so ein bisschen mit ins Boot zu holen, also die die Konsumenten am anderen Ende und 
wieder mehr so in die Richtung geht, dass man auch saisonaler ist, dass man versteht, wie da die Abläufe sind in der Natur, von denen wir ja eigentlich in der Stadt total entkoppelt sind über Supermärkte, in denen immer alles verfügbar ist und auch verfügbar sein soll. Das ist ja weder natürlich noch nachhaltig und es wird auch nie nachhaltig sein. Kann es einfach nicht, weil es in der Natur der Sache liegt. Not only is this turning our natural landscapes into deserts, but also our cities. Uh, my partner Jonah and I were living in that neighborhood and we didn't have access to supermarkets, farmers markets, uh, community gardens or any way to get fresh whole food. So the only way that our family was able to do that was to join a community supported agriculture program, which is like a subscription for vegetables and walk over two miles because there wasn't a bus line to go and, and pick up these foods and bring them back home. The first thing to point out is that conventional industrial agriculture is not currently feeding people adequately. It's producing massive uh, loads of empty calories and it's producing food mountains that put poorer farmers in other parts of the world out of production that allows for corporate takeovers. Put differently, it's not so much that our agriculture system is broken. It's working exactly as intended, and that's the problem. We have left the production of food in the hands of a few multinational corporations that have only their profits at interest, and who also control most of the world's existing agricultural land. So land ownership um, is important in so many ways. And I think to contextualize that, it should be shared that in the US today, 95% uh, of the agricultural land by acres and 98% of the agricultural land by value is white owned, uh, European descendant owned, which is higher than ever. So almost all of the land has been taken, right, from black and brown people. When we don't own land in a, in a capitalist society that values private ownership, there's always the chance of losing home, losing livelihood, losing your fruit trees and your ability to pass something on to your children. On a global scale, the largest one percent of farms operate on more than 70 percent of the world's farmland. And they do this through intensive output-based agriculture that not only depletes the land and is a main driver of climate change, but it also locks farmers into a food system dominated by those same corporations who also control the supply of seeds, agricultural chemicals, processing and logistics. In contrast, small-scale farmers, mostly located in non-Western countries, who still produce about 50% of their food, often in more sustainable ways, they have little to no direct access to international markets. Small farms and small food companies everywhere are constantly driven out of business, while multinational companies ensure their size, power and profits thanks to political lobbying. Indigenous communities and small-scale farmers are known to preserve nature better, but loose implementation of land rights means that they are easily driven out when multinational corporations decide to take over their land. And you look internationally at the land grabs that are, the corporate land grabs that are going on, also domestically, um, retirement companies increasingly recognizing the value of land and trying to scoop it up. I often flip the question and say, well, how could we justify a society where all the land is concentrated in the hands of one racial group? We really believe that in order to feel liberated and sovereign within the food system, we need to be creating our own food systems. And that's where a lot of our education comes in. You know, it's not just about like, here's some food for you, that's nice. But that doesn't really lead to sovereignty. It just leads to more reliance upon somebody else to give you food. Sustainability is the balance of society, economy, and environment. So what's something that uses all of those? It's food. Um, and so I've been able like to see how food can really revolutionize someone's like world almost like it's not just a like something that you eat and consume it's also like an experience. How we expect to be fed has an impact on the natural world and on the people providing that food. We can start changing an unfair system by first recognizing it as such. It's increasingly clear that traditional farming practices, ones that have been abandoned by a profit-driven agribusiness, have the potential to get us out of a bigger climate mess, all while feeding us better again and restoring climate justice. Not only are we trying to do regenerative, but we are very focused on these heritage practices. I think there's 
a sad and dangerous assumption that so much of of what we consider organic or regenerative is either a historical or uh, has European origins when um, I would posit that the majority are actually indigenous technologies. Part of addressing that is to make sure that we're transferring skills, resources, support, mentorship, inspiration to that next generation of, of black and brown farmers. A food system based on our you know, values and our understanding of our place in the food system would look like everyone knowing how to grow their own food, understanding the inherent relationship, the symbiotic relationship we have with land and with our food and treating the earth with respect and love and care and putting back in what we take out. Regeneration, it's about creating as much as you take. For us, that means utilizing ancestral practices that you know, our ancestors used for hundreds and hundreds of years to make sure that the soil is healthy and happy so that it can continue providing sustenance for centuries to come and you know, generations to come. Modern cities have kept farmland out of sight. But because the way we eat affects natural landscapes, as well as the livelihood of those producing the food we need, the question of how we eat is also the question of how we want to live. It's the question of climate justice. I think there's a risk that it's understood as only this sort of modernist standardization scaling up thing which is just how to scale up from five hectares to 6,000 hectares or whatever. Regenerative agriculture for me is not about that. I think it's very easily be scalable, but in a very different way. So instead of saying you, you, make, you cannot standardize this and then scale it up, no, what you need is more farmers. And the beautiful thing about regenerative agriculture is it's not just focused on farming correctly, it's focused on connecting back to local economy and community and putting farms back in the centers of the community. But there's no reason why this shouldn't be done at scale. Yeah.